going to finish up with our last electrolyte, which is magnesium, and then um, my last and final section will be on um, isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic solutions. So um, hopefully this helps where you're not sitting here listening to hours and hours, but you get to take 10 to 12 minutes to listen to something, take notes, study it a little bit, and then go on. So um, let's finish up with magnesium imbalance and the clinical manifestations of, of hypermagnesemia versus hypomagnesemia. Again, hypermagnesemia is high levels of magnesium in the blood, and that's when it's greater than 2.5 milligrams per deal. And then hypomagnesemia is less than 1.5 milligrams per deal. So with hypermagnesemia, what we're going to see with our patients is we're going to see a lethargy or drowsiness, muscle weakness, okay, urinary retention, nausea and vomiting, all right, diminished deep tendon reflexes, flushed warm skin, especially in the facial area, and decreased pulse and decreased blood pressure. Okay, so on the flip side of that with hypomagnesium, we're going to see confusion, muscle cramps. Is this sounding very similar to some other electrolyte imbalances as well? But we'll also see tremor and seizures and vertigo, which is dizziness with standing up or movement, hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. Okay. And when you guys get into your OB rotation, we put, put patients on, high, on magnesium to help reduce um, contractions. Deep, you will be checking deep tendon reflexes in the OB area. Um, we may also see the Shostak's and the Trousseau sign with hypomagnesemia. And then we'll have an increased pulse, an increased blood pressure, and then potential for dysrhythmias. Okay. So with the nursing implementation, implementation for hypermagnesemia, um, with these particular patients, we're going to have them avoid magnesium-containing drugs. A lot of times, individuals with hypermagnesemia are renal patients, okay, and they have an impaired renal function. Uh, we're also going to limit the intake of magnesium-containing foods such as green vegetables, nuts, bananas, oranges, peanut butter, chocolate, all the good things that people want to eat. And if they have good renal function, they're going to increase the fluids and they're going to give them diuretics to help to get the magnesium off. If they are have poor renal function, then those individuals are going to have to be dialyzed in order to get the magnesium um, out of their system. For hypomagnesemia, the treatment is dependent on the underlying cause, and the mild hypomagnesemia, we're going to give oral supplements and increase diet dietary intake of food containing magnesium. So for severe or hypocalcemia, when hypocalcemia is present, they're going to give them IV magnesium or IV magnesium sulfate. They're going to monitor vital signs. And then with rapid administration of magnesium, this can lead to hypotension and cardiac arrest. So magnesium is not something that you would administer very quickly. Um, so going back to magnesium just for a minute, um, the thing about magnesium, and I've seen it with cardiac patients, is they, uh, they can cause dysrhythmias, and sometimes you'll start to see PVCs and irritability with cardiac patients as well with magnesium. I don't see a lot of that in your, in your med surge book, but I see a lot of cardiologists that will order magnesium levels when individuals begin to have dysrhythmias um, on their EKG monitors. I'm going to go ahead and continue on with this since it's such, this was such a short section. I'm going to finish up um, with oral fluid replacements and talking about isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions that we're going to be using. Later on in the semester, we'll be having a lab where we teach you IV therapy and we teach you how to start an IV and things like that. And so I'm just going to kind of start out talking about the different types of IV solutions. So with oral fluids and electrolyte replacement. We have to correct the underlying cause of what's going on with their electrolytes or what's going on with their fluid. The oral so rehydration solutions that, will, that they may use is water, things that, that contain potassium, sodium glucose, such as uh, your sports drinks, electrolyte drinks, and things like that. Okay, um, so glucose is going to provide calories, but also the absorption of sodium and water in the small intestine. So a lot of times they will add glucose to those things. And so what we need to do when we're thinking about oral and fluid replacement is giving somebody cola drinks is not the best thing. It can actually lead to osmotic diuresis and in an inadvertently not correct the fluid imbalance. IV and electrolyte replacements. What we do when we, when we start an IV on somebody, doctors will order specific types of fluids based off of what's going on with that patient. So we may put somebody on a maintenance IV, IV fluid therapy, okay? 
maybe they are going to have surgery or they came in dehydrated and they need to have that, you know, they're, they're out of balance. So they need to be put back into balance. So they're going to put them on that maintenance solution. They may also order a corrective or replacement therapy for losses. Okay, depending on the type of loss that they have is going to be the type of fluid that they order. Okay, and I'm going to explain the different types of fluid in just, a, in just a few moments. So the type is determined based off maintenance and then the laboratory results that the physician is looking at. So when we look at solutions, okay, I'm going to start out with we have hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. All right, so hypotonic solutions, if you think about it like this, if somebody's cellular in the cells, okay, their cells are in a hypertonic state, all right? Hypertonic means that those cells are shriveled up, maybe, and they have some cellular dehydration. A physician may choose to use a hypotonic solution, okay, in order to hydrate that patient. So in a hypotonic solution, there's going to be more water than electrolytes, all right? So the osmolality is less than 250 milliosmoles per kilogram. So this dilutes the extracellular fluid, and it lowers the serum osmolality, okay? So water moves from the extracellular fluid into the interstitial spaces in the cells, okay? And if you can't grasp your brains around this, I'm going to try to post a video that I, show, that I showed in previous classes of about uh, where they use an egg to kind of show you how this concept works, okay? Hypotonic solutions are not good for replacement because they can de deplete the extracellular fluid, okay, um, and lower the blood pressure, okay. So this, the hypotonic solution causes cellular swelling, so we have to monitor for signs of cerebral edema when we're giving somebody a hypotonic solution. And these are some examples of hypotonic. Half normal saline, or what we like to call 0.45%, sodium chloride, and you'll hear us say half normal, 5% dextrose in water, or D5W. Typically, these solutions, the dextrose starts out as an isotonic solution, but the dextrose quickly metabolizes, and then it becomes an isotonic solution, okay? So if you look right here with hypotonic solutions, again, we're going to dilute the extracellular fluid, lowering the serum osmolality, so the water is going to move from the extracellular fluid into the interstitial spaces in the cells, okay? Um, so like it says, it's not good for replacement because it's going to delete that extracellular fluid. Isotonic solutions, if you look here, I want you to think about these as equal. Similar to concentration of water and electrolytes to plasma. So this expands the extracellular fluid. So there's going to be no shift when we give this. Okay, the osmolality is between 250 and 375 milliosmoles per kilogram. And this is ideal for extracellular volume deficits. We don't have cellular dehydration with this, we just have an extracellular volume deficit. So examples are 0.9% sodium chloride, or what we call normal saline, lactated ringers. And there is a chart on page 293. Do you have to memorize every single one of these? No. What you need to remember is the ones that I gave you, you know, in your PowerPoint slides for remembering what types of solutions are out there. Okay. So this is what we're going to get. Patients go into surgery, what have you. They might put them on an isotonic solution. They may also look at lab values to determine what they need. Okay. Hypertonic. Okay, solutions initially raises the osmolality of the extracellular fluid and expands the volume. Okay, so it's used to treat hyponatremia and trauma patients with head injuries. So if you've got a patient with hyponatremia, low sodium, they may give them, say, a 3% sodium chloride or sodium salt in order to use to initially treat that hyponatremia. Okay. When we give somebody a hypertonic solution, it requires frequent monitoring of the blood pressure the lungs, and the serum sodium levels to make sure that that level does not go up too high. So examples would be 5% half normal saline or D5 half normal saline, okay, and there's another, there is, and 3% sodium is, is another one that I have seen used, okay. Um, so we're going to see table 1617 on page 293 that goes a little bit more in depth into talking about hyper, the types of hypertonic solutions. Again, you do not have to memorize all of them. You just need to know what it is and why we're using it, okay? Other solutions that you will see, sometimes we'll use solutions with additives. So we have IV additives such as KCL, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium sulfate, um, bicarbonate as HCO3. We'll have different purposes for using those. And then sometimes we'll see colloids used, which is contain large molecules that increase the oncotic pressure in order to pull fluid into the blood vessels. So if we've got somebody that has um, 
third spacing, lots of edema, um, things like that. Their protein levels are low. Then they, you may see them use albumin 5% or 25%, which is a hypertonic solution. Okay. So basically this is used, you think about it, that to treat somebody when they're in a hypotonic state. So if they're in a hypotonic state, their cells are swollen or they have too much fluid, so they need to pull that fluid out of those cells, so they're going to use a hypertonic solution, and that's what albumin helps to do. And then dextrin is pulls additional fluid into the intravascular spaces as well. So we'll do a little bit more activity in class and in the lab when we get actually into IV therapy with, with the different types of solutions.